Hi, I'm at Siam Center where it's very nicely decorated for the upcoming Chinese New Year. In this video, I want to talk about three guys who, after World War II, uh, were very successful in their enterprises here in Thailand, in Bangkok specifically, and there was an unintended consequence or an unintended um, result of their successes that kind of created, you know, the bawdy red light reputation of Thailand came out of the successes of these three guys. Prior to World War II, high fashion in Thailand, for the people that could afford it, would be all about silk. And one of the things that I really find interesting is that after World War II, there are many Westerners that came to, uh, to Thailand and influenced the culture in a lot of ways. But Thailand has uh, been able to uh, retain its, uh, its cultural identity uh, despite that. One of the first people that had an impact on, on Thailand culture through fashion was Jim Thompson. I did a video about Jim Thompson, really interesting guy. He was a spy. He was an upper-class American who, during World War II, joined the OSS, became a spy, wound up in Thailand, and stayed here after the war, where he modernized Thai, uh, Thai silk weaving into an international uh, trade uh, with his brand on it. And it's still here today. It seems that everybody with a camera here in Bangkok has recently been at the Hua Lam Pung train station to take photographs because they're closing the station. Well, it seems that the Jim Thompson uh, enterprise was no exception. How do you like a good conspiracy theory? Are you a believer in uh, an area 52 conspiracies, you know, stuff like that? Well, stay tuned to the end of this video and I'll tell you a humdinger. This guy, Jim Thompson, successful guy. I kind of admire him, a real renaissance man. But he disappeared under mysterious circumstances. And I'll tell you why I've changed my mind on the possible cause of his disappearance being a normal thing. And I've gotten on the conspiracy bandwagon. And I'll tell you why at the end of the video. It sure doesn't look anything like a banana farm now. I'm standing in the middle of the uh, neighborhood known as Pat Pong. And Pat Pong is named after the family that owned it, the Pat Pong family. In my last video, I talked about Alexander McDonald and how uh, he became a very successful guy here in Bangkok, uh, opened the Bangkok Post after his days in the military as an OSS spy. And of course, Jim Thompson, who I just mentioned, was one of his colleagues. Jim Thompson, also an OSS guy, very successful in his military career. Uh, stayed around and built a, a silk empire. Uh, he became the station chief of the OSS uh, for a short time after the war. And of course the CIA, the civilian uh, spy agency, came in and, and, and replaced them. Uh, Thompson and the CIA kind of clashed, but he was a valuable asset to them and they maintained a relationship over the years. Those two American guys were very close with the gentleman by the name of Udam Patpong. See, the Patpong family was very wealthy. They owned a lot of farmland. And this banana farm that I'm standing on now um, became a headquarters for the occupying Japanese. And Udam was a uh, very motivated uh, uh, Thai freedom fighter. And he left the country and trained with the OSS, with uh, uh, people like McDonald and Thompson. And uh, the th those three men came back into Thailand to ferment, ferment unrest against the Japanese occupiers just before the war ended. A short time after they arrived, the war was over. As a matter of fact, McDonald, on his, his flight in here, uh, the, you know, the war ended. So, as I say, McDonald, Thompson, the same thing as thousands of other soldiers who've come to... Thailand, and as McDonald put it, had eaten of the lotus blossom, didn't want to go back to the States. McDonald went into publishing, Thompson into silk production. Udom Pak Pong was home. And this land, this land that was once a banana farm, was bequeathed to him in a will. Uh, when his father passed away, he was the oldest son, the property went to him. 
Now, it was not Udon Patpong's intention to create the world's largest collection of whorehouses, but that's kind of what developed. See, all these row houses um, replaced the banana farm. Udon was changing the neighborhood into what we might call a commercial development, you know, or, or a, uh, an industrial park, if you will, but it was, it was light industry. It was more uh, geared toward uh, administrative offices. And because of Udon's connections with the likes of Thompson and McDonald and the OSS and the CIA, they had a lot of influence. And they were able to attract the attention after the war and the rapid development that was taking place uh, Udam was able to attract the attention of many uh, foreign businesses who wanted to relocate here. And through his connections in the, uh, in the Thai government, in the U.S. government, in the British government, and, and the clandestine services and all those people, they were able to get the word out, you want to go to a safe place and set up your headquarters? Head to Pot Pong's Banana Farm. Well, okay, they didn't exactly say go to the banana farm, but what they did is they directed commercial tenants to uh, uh, Udam's development. And people like uh, Transworld Airlines, TWA, and, and other airlines put their headquarters here. Uh, IBM had, a, had, a, uh, had an office here. There were uh, dozens of, of international firms looking to exploit the growth now available here in Thailand, and they put their offices here. The CIA opened an office here. Eventually, the U.S. Air Force had a little bit of, a, uh, of a, uh, an office, a, a clandestine services kind of uh, office here. So fill up a neighborhood with pilots, executives, U.S. spies, high-ranking military officials, stuff like that, what's going to follow automatically you guessed it, the girls. This once thriving entertainment zones, as the Thais call it, a euphemism for a large collection of four houses and bars, uh, dates back to the 50s. This is one of the oldest establishments still, still here. I'm sorry to see that it's closed. And this guy with the horn is really annoying. Okay, it isn't a guy. Somebody's selling something. <laughs> yeah, this once thriving uh, collection of bars and entertainment spaces to uh, kind of co-op the Thai euphemism is just a, a shadow of its former self. Now it is early in the evening, but it's Saturday, and this place would have been jammed with people two years ago. So uh, they've certainly taken it on the chin uh, during, during the COVID mess. Uh, it is a noisy place. I was hoping for it to be a little more quiet for my video shoot, but that ain't happening. Somebody's beeping or dragging or motorcycling or always something here in Asia. I think the Americans get a bad rap. They're blamed for creating the sex trade here in Bangkok, and that's just not so. Um, you know, sex workers go back centuries in Asia, certainly in Bangkok. So, and that's no exception here, but they were kind of responsible for bringing the neon lights. Hello, girls. So, yeah, it was kind of an unintended consequence, or let's call it an unplanned consequence of, you know, developments and enterprising guys who, uh, who had the influence to direct businesses into this area of, uh, of Bangkok, the Pat Pong family farm, which is simply known as Pat Pong these days. Say that to uh, a, a lot of uh, people that know, Pat, uh, that know Bangkok well, I'll know exactly what you're talking about. Pat Pong, it's a neighborhood. But it was named, it is named after the family. I suspect they still own the area. It hasn't been developed. There has to be a reason for that, but I, I'm guessing about that kind of stuff. So yeah, what happened is you put foreigners with a, with a steady paycheck uh, concentrated in a certain place and girls seeking to exploit uh, the, that revenue will, uh, will, will show up and entertain said business people and soldiers and spies. And uh, that's how Pat Pong initially developed. Now, 
maybe a decade later when you know hostilities broke out between the Americans and the Vietnamese and and the Australians they used to come here uh, for rest and relaxation from uh, from the war in Vietnam and that's when these kinds of entertainment zones really took off as a matter of fact Pat Pong became too expensive and so it started expanding out to other places like Mana Plaza and so sort of Cowboy and uh, yeah the law of unintended consequences. I don't know if it's a law, but you know, shit happens. <laughs> so at the end of this video, I'm gonna put up one of those little squares uh, that has a whole lot more detail, the story about Jim Thompson that you can take a look at if, if you're interested in that. As I said at the beginning of this video, um, I had uh, Thompson, who, had, uh, who was a wealthy man with a lot of influence and power uh, connected to you know, the big shots in the U.S. government and the Thai government, and he was a millionaire with a very successful business. Uh, he uh, uh, he was also a former spy. He went on vacation in uh, nearby Malaysia. He went for a walk in the jungle and disappeared. Well, you can just imagine the uh, conspiracy theories that popped up out of that. Well, when I first did my research on Jim Thompson, I, it's, I guess about almost two years ago, and, you know, for the video that I'm, I'm putting up here, I found a, a research report uh, by a, a PhD, he calls himself a forensic, uh, I don't know, forensic something or other, but he was, a, he, he was an academic and uh, he made the case for uh, Jim Thompson uh, just, you know, walking out of his cottage to take a walk in the jungle. His health wasn't that great and they might have had a heart attack or a stroke or, you know, he just uh, had an issue, fell down in the jungle and died and passed away and jungles have a way of eliminating uh, organic material, to put it politely, and that's why he was never found. And I went with that because it was a very uh, uh, logical sounding report. Well, when I was researching this video, I actually found that that guy on YouTube, and I don't know, maybe it's the influence of the uh, crazy psychology videos that I've been doing. I, I now uh, am more prone to poke holes in the, the thesis the theses and the conclusions of academics and I started poking holes in this guy's story and he doesn't know Jim Thompson very well I'll just give you one example he said two times in his video that Jim Thompson went from private to lieutenant colonel I think he left the service as a major I'm not sure of that but he was never a private he was he was not a private kind of guy he was a very uh, high society individual and he went into the service as a uh, as a lieutenant, uh, as a commissioned officer. I'm 100% certain of that. So uh, this guy made a lot of other mistakes, but that's the one that jumped out at me and made me start investigating it. And I've since decided this guy is making a lot of shit up too, just the way the crazy psychologists do. So I'm leaving open all the conspiracy theories. What do you think? What happened to Jim Thompson? Where did he go? Was he eaten by the jungle? Kidnapped by pirates? Who the hell knows? Uh, I don't think we'll ever know the answer to it, but it makes for an interesting story if you want to go down that rabbit hole. So, yeah, thanks for watching. See you the next time.